Okay, we learned about entropy so that we can go back and do a prediction as to whether or not a reaction was spontaneous or not. Okay, so that's your remembering. Why, why do, what's the point of all of this? The first idea was to use enthalpy. Enthalpy was not a good predictor. Okay, so then the second idea was, well, this entropy seems to be something. And when you consider processes and you're thinking about your everyday life, it seems like everything just seems to get more disordered spontaneously all the time. So that seemed like a good predictor. If a reaction, and here it is, the, the second notion was this, that if a system increases its disorder, okay, then the process is going to be spontaneous. So that means if delta S is positive, it should be spontaneous, and that was the notion. Well, if we're trying to find a perfect predictor, all we have to find is one example that doesn't hold true to that. So let's mosey on over to water again, and let's think about the sign of delta S when water liquid, okay, the liquid water is placed in a working freezer, okay? You're thinking about the change of state and you're thinking about the sign convention. All right, so what did you come up with? Well, I hope you came up with that it's getting less disordered. It's going from a liquid state to a solid state. It's getting less disordered and that would be a negative value for that, okay? The disorder is decreasing, the delta S is negative, does it happen spontaneously? Yes. Water will spontaneously turn into ice when you put it under the right conditions inside of the freezer spontaneously. All right? So if that happens spontaneously, we have to go back to that notion, which seemed like it was dead on, and say, ah, it's not dead on all the time. And we will cross that out as our predictor. Thermodynamics is about trying to predict whether a process will occur spontaneously or not. The delta H of a reaction does not predict it, though very often spontaneous processes are exothermic. Delta S doesn't predict it, though very often, more times than not, a spontaneous process will have a, po I mean, a, yeah, an increase in disorder, a positive delta S. But that is not a perfect uh, predictor. We're ready for our perfect predictor. It's so perfect, it's called the second law, law of thermodynamics. A law is something that is that way every time it's observed, okay? It is not a hypothesis, it's not a theory, it is an observed truism. And so this second law of thermodynamics is where we can find no exceptions, it is that way every time it's tried, and this is what it says. If you want a perfect predictor of whether a process is spontaneous, all you need to know is the change of entropy of the universe, okay? If you know it for the entire universe, and it is positive for the entire universe, increase in entropy, that's a positive delta S of the universe, then that is a perfect predictor. And that right there, when you say it like that, seems totally impossible. You can't possibly know if I'm putting an ice cube in the freezer here on planet Earth in my home, whether or not the delta S of the universe is increasing. But it's really not all that hard to do, okay? I promise. All right, so what is the universe? The universe is two things. It is the system. Now for us, that's the process taking place. The water freezing, the water boiling, the sodium and the water mixing to make hydrogen gas and sodium hydroxide, the diamond turning into graphite. The process is the system, okay? The surroundings is everything else. And if that is bigger than zero, an increase in disorder of the universe, then the process will be spontaneous, okay? That is a perfect predictor. We will never find an exception to that. All right, so big, bold blue letters, a big red box around it. Second law of thermodynamics is the entropy of the universe increases for a spontaneous process, and you've got that there as our predictor. So, that's all we need to know. We need to know the delta S of the system. We need to know the delta S of the surroundings. And then you just add them together, okay? If you add them together and it's positive, then the process is going to be spontaneous under the conditions that you're monitoring. So you have to set a set of conditions and say under this set of conditions, it is spontaneous. All right, now what if it's negative? We don't say it's not spontaneous. 
If it's negative, what we will say is the reverse process is spontaneous. Or it will, be, will become spontaneous if you apply an outside intervention such as work. Now, before I go any further, I want to give you a very common example of this process. It's negative, so it's not spontaneous, but you can force it to become spontaneous by supplying an external source such as work, and that is a battery. Battery runs your cell phone or a little battery that you put in your remote control. That has a chemical reaction that's taking place inside of it. That chemical reaction happens spontaneously, and when it happens, it generates electrons and can complete a circuit. Okay, so the electrons are being transferred in this chemical reaction spontaneously. You are using that electrical current to run your device. All right, so what happens when the battery runs low, if it's rechargeable? You hook it up to a source of electrons that's going to push in to that battery and force the reverse reaction to occur. So the reverse reaction will occur because you're supplying that external energy from the electrons and the work from those electrons, okay? So if the delta S of the universe is negative, we would say the reverse process is spontaneous or you can supply external energy uh, work source to make it occur. I don't generally go with that parentheses statement from here for a while, okay? We'll just say forward reaction is gonna be spontaneous if the delta S of the universe is positive. The delta S of the universe is negative. The reverse process is spontaneous. There is a middle ground where it's equal to zero, and we will talk about that later, okay? Um, now, I said all you need to do is calculate two things, right? I said you need to be able to calculate the delta S of the system. You need to calculate the delta S of the surroundings. Add them together, okay? and that will give you the delta S of the universe. And as long as that is greater than zero, positive, it's increasing its disorder, it's going to be spontaneous. So we're gonna learn how to calculate both of those things. We're gonna start with the delta S of the surroundings because that is not hard to do. And it's going to play on our delta H that we learned about when we studied thermochemistry. Then we'll come back a little bit later and see how do you calculate the delta S of the system. Okay, so calculating the delta S of the surroundings is what we're going to do first. Well, how does the surroundings get a change in entropy when a reaction is taking place? Well, the only exchange with the surroundings when that reaction takes place is going to be heat, okay? The change in entropy is going to occur by the reaction taking place and transferring thermal energy, that's what delta H is, is a transfer of thermal energy from the system to the surroundings or from the surroundings to the system. That's how you mess with the surroundings, is by transferring heat. So if you do a process and it gives off heat, we just need to monitor the surroundings nearby. We don't need to go to planet Jupiter or Alpha Centauri somewhere and say, well, what kind of change is that making when this reaction takes place? Because it rapidly drops off. The way the surroundings is affected is by the system giving off heat to the surroundings or absorbing heat from the surroundings, and the immediate surroundings is all we really have to focus on. So there's two possibilities here. There is the possibility that on the left there, that heat is leaving the system and going into the surroundings, or there's the possibility on the right there that the heat is leaving the surroundings and going into the system. So let's look through um, the words that appear on the screen here. Here's the first one. It's exothermic, okay? In the exothermic reaction, I want you to think about what the sign is of delta H for an exothermic process. Well, when it's exothermic, delta H is negative, okay? Now, what's happening to the surroundings? You're giving off heat to the surroundings. When we studied calorimetry, we learned that when you give off heat to the surroundings, the temperature of the surroundings is going to increase, all right? That's how we measured the change in enthalpy is to do calorimetry and put a thermometer in there and see what's happening with the thermometer. All right, so then the next question is, 
and unfortunately I've got some words there, it's racing, okay? So the delta S of the surroundings is going to increase because the temperature goes up. That's what we learned in our last, last lesson. Whenever the temperature goes up, the entropy goes up, it increases. And if it's increasing, what's the sign of delta S? Well, if delta S, if S is increasing, delta S is positive. What was delta H? It was exothermic, it was negative. All right, let's go to the right-hand side of this image. Heat is leaving the surroundings and going into the system. So this is an example of an endothermic reaction. Reaction is taking place, it's absorbing the heat from the surroundings going into the system. If it's endothermic, what's the sign of delta H? Well, obviously it's positive. Now what's going to happen to the temperature of the surroundings if you're pulling heat out of the surroundings? Well, the temperature goes down. If the temperature is going down, what's happening to the entropy? The disorder. Well, as the temperature goes down, the entropy goes down. If it's going down, what's the sign? Well, decreasing is a change that's negative. So what do we see here? A negative delta H leads to a, of a reaction, leads to a positive delta S of the surroundings. And over here, a positive delta H of the reaction leads to a negative delta S of the surroundings. So we see a connection between them. And the connection is proportional, but opposite in sign. So whatever the one is doing, the other one is doing exactly, well, it's not exactly the same magnitude because this is not, that's not an equal sign. Okay, there's something else going on here, but they are proportional. As one goes up, the other one is going up. I should say is going up but negative. That's a weird way of saying it, okay? And it's not just as one goes up, the other one goes down because one's positive and one's negative, but you get the idea of this connection. They're opposite in sign, but proportional. Now, does it matter where that minus is? No, it doesn't matter where that minus is. If this were negative and I changed the sign, this would be, well, you can't see what I'm pointing at. Let's try this. If this part were negative, and I change the sign, this would be positive. If this part were positive and I change the sign, this would be negative. Okay, it doesn't matter whether it's endothermic or exothermic, that would apply. Okay, so that's a pretty busy screen, but you get an idea of the relationship between the delta S of the system, and our system is the reaction, almost always what we're looking at, but it's whatever is undergoing the change, and the surrounding is what is around it. Now let's see if we can get rid of the proportionality symbol and turn it into an equal sign, okay? Now, what is true about the effect of the surroundings is, if the surroundings is at a higher temperature in one situation than in another, then the heat transfer to the surrounding has less effect upon the entropy. And I tried to think of an example of this that, um, I would be familiar with in my everyday life, but I don't know if you would be familiar with in your everyday life because they've changed up refrigerators a little bit. But when a refrigerator works, it is taking heat out of the inside and it's putting it out into the surroundings. And when I grew up, there was a little radiator down at the bottom of the refrigerator um, that I could lay down next to and feel the warmth coming out, which was good at some times and not so good at the other. I remember we had a cat. That cat would always lay right there at the bottom of the refrigerator where the heat is coming out of the refrigerator and being pumped into the room. Well, if it's a cold day, and I mean cold inside the house, and that heat is pumping out into the surroundings, it affects that surroundings. And you walk by and you're like, ooh, that feels good. And you notice the heat coming out. It has a big impact on you. But if the room is already warm and there's some the same amount of heat coming into the room, it is not going to be as noticeable. And that's what I can kind of hold on to um, in order to make this relationship work in my mind. The greater the temperature of the surroundings, the less impact the heat coming out into the surroundings is going to have on its entropy. So if it's already up here and we're adding a little heat, it's going up a little bit. But if it was down here and you're adding a heat, you're going to notice a bigger change in the entropy of the surroundings. So this is what gets us an equal sign instead of a proportionality symbol here. 
the delta S of the surroundings is calculated by taking the delta H of the system, which is our reaction, and we learned how to calculate delta H of reactions in a lot of different ways in thermal chemistry. And if you divide it by temperature, and that temperature needs to be in Kelvin, then you will get the delta S of the surroundings. I said that, okay. So, if we know the delta S of the system, and we know the delta S of the surroundings, then all we have to do is take those two values and add them together. If it's positive, the delta S of the universe is going to be spontaneous, okay? Or, if it's negative, the reverse reaction is going to be spontaneous. That's all you have to do. So we have learned how to calculate the delta S of the surroundings. We need to be able to calculate the delta S of the system, add them together, and you've got it. You've got it licked. You're going to be able to predict whether a reaction is spontaneous or not. That takes two different calculations, maybe three if you consider. Before you can calculate the delta S of the surroundings, you need the delta H of the reaction. Get the delta H of the reaction and calculate the delta S of the surroundings. Then go calculate the delta S of the system. Add them together. A lot of steps. A little green box right there says there is going to be a simpler way eventually that we're going to see. An easier way to predict it than having to go through all of that. But that doesn't change the fact that the second law of thermodynamics is the foundation of what we do next. The delta S of the universe must be positive for a process to be spontaneous. All right, so that takes us through that lesson. We're going to talk about the easier way next.